Well, hello everybody. Welcome to MTZ Cast Episode One. I'm Ben Winslet from MarchToZion.com, coming to you from Huntsville, Alabama. I've had the idea for the past year or so in the back of my mind to produce a regular episodic video cast for MarchToZion.com. This, in my mind, is going to be more casual sort of like a traditional radio program, what you'd hear on the radio, but obviously in video format. Will this be every week? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, but I think that we, and when I say we, I mean Primitive Baptist, we need more media. We need more writings. We need more writers. We need more radio broadcasts. We need more video streams. We need more live streams. We need more media of every sort of media. Think about what we're up against in this world. You have a constant bombardment on the airwaves, on social media, and on the television of just the the utmost level of filthiness. And God's people are in the midst of this, surrounded by this. They're hungry. They're struggling. They're desiring to live for Christ, and they need resources. And so many times people turn to major mega parachurch ministries for this. And concerning my people, the Primitive Baptists, we need resources to turn to among our people. And so that's, that's what's on my mind and my heart. How often we get to do this, I don't know. I'd love to have guests from time to time when we have a guest speaker come to this area and we have the capabilities here at Flint River Primitive Baptist Church to, to do a lot of things like that, and we we hope to entrust to in the coming weeks. A little word about this up front. It's going to be off the cuff, and it's going to be casual. There may be times that that we're silly. There may be times that we're serious. There may be, there may be times that something tragic happens in the world, and we run to the studio and produce a video because God's people need to hear from the Word of God right then and there. And so this is not going to sound like your normal radio program, and it's not going to sound like your normal sermon. I'm not going to be dressed in a suit, praise God. And so it'll be different. It'll be unusual. It'll be unique. But again, I think that it'll be very beneficial for our people. And I'd encourage you preachers to get on your church's Facebook page and YouTube channel and do the same thing. Uh, I don't want to be the only person doing this, but I don't mind. I don't mind uh, being a trailblazer in that regard. Okay, enough about that. What I hope to do for our first series here on our webcast, our video cast from MarchDesign.com, is a series on your average church articles of faith. Every church, if it's a church, has a statement of faith. Even any church out in the world is going to have, unless they, unless their only statement of faith is that they believe nothing. And I think in this country, maybe we've gotten to a point where some churches, their statement of faith is that they don't believe anything. But any church that tries to be a church is going to have a statement of faith, articles of faith. Some perhaps will call it an abstract of principles. You might think, why would you take the time to begin a video feed and come to us with the articles of faith? Well, these are the founding principles of a church. You might think, that sounds technical. Why, why would you want to do that? These are the founding principles of any organization, your statement of faith. We're going to use the statement of faith that is online at march2zion.com. So if you want to read a copy of these, you can go to march2zion.com, click on the About tab in the top menu, and go to Statement of Faith. And there at that page, you'll find what we consider to be non-negotiable principles. When someone joins a church here at Flint River, we have a set of articles of faith that date back to 1808, one of the first things that I do is give them a copy of our articles of faith. It's that important. We consider it to be that crucial that 
I want them to know what we believe, what we stand for. These are the principles that we hold to be true. This is what we believe God's Word teaches. We believe that God has spoken through His Word, and these are principles in His Word that we cannot disagree on and maintain a high degree of fellowship. Now, there are things in the Bible that we can disagree on and agree to disagree. The interpretation of parables, finer points of eschatology, there are things that we can disagree on, maybe the understanding or the interpretation of a passage here or there, and that's fine. That is totally fine. However, things that are in our articles of faith, we simply have to agree on to be a part of that particular church or that particular organization. If you're searching for a church body, one of the first things that you need to look for is their statement of faith, what they believe. And read that carefully. Look up the proof text they go to to defend what they believe and make the decision if you're shopping for a church whether or not you want to be a part of that organization. It's so very important. We, we live in a day where I don't, I don't know that many Christians even know what they believe. And so this study of articles of faith are so very crucial and so very important in our day and age. Now, just to show you how seriously we take this here at Flint River, check this out. In the churchyard here at Flint River Primitive Baptist Church in Huntsville, Alabama, we have a six-foot-tall granite monument that was installed in the 1950s that has our Articles of Faith. So you can see that. Commemorating the first organized church in Alabama, that's the first organized Baptist church. There were Catholic and Methodist churches that predate Flint River, but as far as Baptist churches, this is the oldest Baptist church in the state of Alabama. Established October 2nd, 1808, upon the doctrine of salvation by grace as attested by her articles of faith. So, in our churchyard, literally, what we believe is set in stone. So, there's no mistaking when you pull up into our facility, you see this giant monument, you think, what is that? Is that the tombstone of the first pastor? <laughs> what is this giant granite monument? It's what we believe. And so this is very, very important for a church body. Now, as I said, we'll have the articles of faith for marchdesign.com. These are a little different than the articles of faith of Flint River in wording, but in substance, it's the same exact thing. And sometimes churches will have 10 articles. Sometimes they'll combine more than one of our articles into one article. Sometimes they'll have an expanse, an expansion of the articles of faith, maybe 14 or 15 articles of faith. It's whatever that church believed to be non-negotiable when it was founded. So, our first article of faith that we're going to share with you, Statement of Faith, Article Number 1, our first assertion. We believe in one true and living God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Again, that's the Statement of Faith of March to Zion.com that we adopted from my old home church, Ebenezer Primitive Baptist Church in Westover, Alabama, back in 2003 when we were founded. Flint River's Articles of Faith are very similar. It says, we believe in only one true and living God. The difference there is in the word only. We believe in only one true and living God, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And that abstract of principles has proof texts that are provided afterwards. This is such an important principle. Every other principle in our articles of faith, every other thing that we believe as Christians, is built upon this principle, this assertion that we believe in only one true and living God. You know, this is what the Apostle Paul did in the book of Acts chapter 17 as he was at Mars Hill Ares Rock, Areopagus, he goes before the Epicureans, 
Epicureans and the Stoics, and he begins to preach unto them Christ. And he doesn't do it in the same way that he would to the Jews in the synagogue, for example. To those people in the synagogues, he would open and allege that Christ, that is the Messiah, must needs have suffered and died and risen again, and that this Jesus is Christ. To the pagans, to the non-Jews, to those that didn't know the true and living God, Paul would begin at creation. And he would preach the God of creation, and then he would take them through the crucifixion and the resurrection, and all the way up through to the final judgment. So his, his uh, manner, if you will, was different with the pagan than it was to the Jew, because the pagan didn't believe in only one true and living God. The pagan believes that there are many gods. Think about the people in ancient Greece. They believed that there were a multiplicity of gods. You have Mount Olympus. You have gods of the afterlife. You have gods of the sun moving across the sky. You have gods of folly and foolishness, gods of wine, gods of war. But the Bible presents this assertion that there is one true and living God. So that's principle number one that we believe you would not even be allowed to be a part of a church without believing in the fact that there is only one true and living God, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, these three are one. Now, I said that this was the first assertion of our articles of faith, the first belief that is a spouse, but I want you to understand that this is also Scripture's first assertion. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, as the Bible begins, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. So in the beginning of time, in the beginning of the Bible, Scripture asserts that the universe was created by God, by a deity. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And so we live in a creation. We are the product of a creating God, a being, an entity, an eternal being, a deity, divinity, who has created us. And as you read through the Genesis account, please understand that we believe this to be very literal. It is not interpreted as allegorical or metaphorical to the Lord Jesus. Jesus talked about Adam and Eve as literal people. Jesus talked about Noah as a literal man. Jesus talked about Jonah as a literal man. So if Jesus talked about Adam and Eve and Noah and Moses and Jonah as literal men, Jesus died, Jesus was buried, Jesus rose again on the third day and ascended up to glory where he's on the right hand of the Father, then I should take what Jesus said seriously and I should believe what Jesus believes about the creation, even if I can't understand or explain it all. I should believe what Jesus believed about the creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God creates the universe. He speaks it into existence. He doesn't use creative processes that we would use to build because there's nothing there to build with. He creates it by speaking it into existence. It was nothing. Creates it out of nothing. Speaks it into existence. On the sixth day of creation, he makes man. He forms man from the dust of the ground, and he breathes into man's nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. We are made in the image of God. This is so crucial, this first assertion, Scripture's first assertion, the identity of the God that Moses is describing, and our first assertion that we believe in only one true and living God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. The first and the greatest heresies within Christendom all were an attack on the makeup the identity, the characteristics of this God. You have Gnosticism that denied the divinity of Jesus. You have Arianism that denied the divinity of Jesus. You have heresy after heresy that has sprung into existence in the history of the world, all attacking the fundamental makeup and nature of this eternal God. So, 
as we consider this God, what does it say in our Articles of Faith? We believe in only one true and living God, which we'll comment on that in a moment. The Father, the Word, or the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Any doctrine that attacks that God is three in one, any doctrine that attacks that God is one, any doctrine that attacks the divinity or the existence of any of the three persons of the Godhead is a heresy. And according to Paul in Galatians chapter 1, when these heresies are presented, the person who presents that is to be anathema. That is to say, religiously excommunicated. Paul would say about a heretic to Titus after the second admonition, reject. When a person denies even the f most fundamental makeup of God, that person is to be rejected as a teacher, and everything that they teach and they believe as a teacher is to be rejected with them. You're not to pay them any attention. You're to respond to them the way that Moses taught the Israelites in Deuteronomy 18. You put that person away from you. You don't speak to that person. Don't be afraid of that person. So this is an extremely severe concept. This is a crucial concept. It's an important concept. All of the great heresies in the world have attacked one part or another of the theology of God himself. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. We believe in only one true and living God, the Father, the Word, or the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. So as we consider the makeup, the character of God, this God has revealed himself in Scripture as a trinity. That is to say, a tri-unity. This word trinity is a tri-unity. And sometimes when that word is spoken, people will say, well, I don't like that word trinity. That, that comes from Catholicism. Well, no, the concept of a three-in-one Godhead is not the product of Catholicism. Please understand me. The concept of a three-in-one Godhead is not the product of Roman Catholicism. This was not a doctrine that was invented in the days of Constantine or in the time after that, but this is fundamental to what the Bible itself presents. This is entry-level Christianity. This is where theology begins. Think about that word theology for just a moment. Theos, which means God, and that ology, logi, comes from logos, which is the word that translates word. You literally have two words used in the New Testament to describe God, to make that word theology. Theology is so very important. This is the beginning of theology in a man's understanding. So we believe in one, only one, true living God, the Father, the Word, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. God exists eternally as Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. God it exists eternally as Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, or the three-in-one Godhead. Now, please understand that there are not three gods. There are not three gods. There is only one God, and yet this God exists in three persons, as three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Now, I'm going to do something that's taboo among a lot of people who believe in predestination today, and I'm going to quote 1 John 5, 7. Why am I going to quote 1 John 5, 7? Because I believe 1 John 5, 7 belongs in the Bible. I accept the received text. I accept the majority text. I reject the critical text. So if you're wondering why the Bible that's in front of me here has a giant KJV on it, it's because I use a Bible that is translated from the family of manuscripts that the church used all throughout the ages. That's another conversation for another day. But 1 John 5, 7 says, There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. You might be thinking, how is it that God can be three distinct persons and yet only one God? Well, this is what we call the mystery of godliness. And as Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit. He was preached unto Gentiles. He was seen of angels. He was received up into glory. Divinity, godliness, the fact that God exists in three in one is something that you nor I can ever explain on this 
side of the grave. We cannot understand it. And any attempt to take it beyond what the Bible teaches is dangerous. Any attempt to take it beyond what the Bible teaches is dangerous because outside of what's plainly revealed in the Word of God, we run the risk of reinventing God. What is it when you reinvent God? Well, it's idolatry. So we don't want to be guilty of reinventing God, recreating God in our own mind. So we just want to leave Scripture where Scripture and how Scripture defines this. We want to place our fence posts at the boundaries the Word of God places, nowhere further in, nowhere further out. And we should do this on every issue. So we have one God, not three gods. He exists in three persons, not just one person. This means that three in one, there are three, and these three are one. God exists in three persons eternally. God is not merely revealing himself in three ways or three dispensations. So we should never say or believe that he referred to himself as Jehovah or the Father in the Old Testament, Jesus the Word, the Son, and Jesus' ministry, and the Holy Spirit after the day of Pentecost or any sort of concoction like that. What that is is modalism which is another one of the heretical attacks on the identity and the makeup of the Godhead. That's to be rejected. There are three. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The, the Father's not the Son. The Son's not the Father. The Father's not the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is not the Son. There are three, and yet these three are one. There is only one God. The Father is just as much God as the Son, is just as much God as the Holy Spirit. And yet these three are one. They make up one God. You say, how can you understand that? The glorious thing is that I can't, which to me ought to be one of the infallible proofs of the reality of this word, because instead of having a God who mirrors us or who is the product of human understanding, human ingenuity, we serve a God and we believe in a God that you can't actually understand. Now, this is to be expected. God himself said through the prophet Isaiah that as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways above your ways. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who's been his counselor? How can we say that we could understand a God who his ways are infinitely higher than our ways? Look, look up the images of Hubble. You can't see to the far extremes of the universe, and that's how high God's ways are above our ways. If that's how high his ways are, then how is it that I could understand fully his person, with a human, fallen, finite mind. Now, I anticipate the day when I shall know even as I am known, and I will see him as he is, and I will experience him in all of his grandeur and glory. But for right now, I simply can't understand him. And that's fine. That's okay. This three-in-one God is revealed very plainly in the New Testament, which we'll mention in just a moment. But he was alluded to, or he revealed himself, concealed himself, you might say, in the Old Testament. This isn't exclusively a New Testament concept. But as Jesus said in John 5, search the scriptures, they are they which testify of me. God existed this way from all eternity. So it shouldn't be surprising then that what we read clearly written in the New Testament is alluded to or depicted in the Old Testament. For example, when God created man, man is made in the image of whom? Man is made in the image of God. When God created man, what did God say? He said, let us make man in our image. Let us, let who? Let me make man in my image? No, let us make man in our image. Why are those words plural when there is but one God? Because God was speaking to himself and God exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God exists as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So he speaks to himself, and he says, Let us make man in our image. And in the likeness and the image of God created he Adam, created he man. In Genesis 1-2, after God created the heavens and the earth, he spoke the earth into existence. The Spirit of God did move upon the face of the waters. Now, if the Holy Ghost is merely the final 
way that God reveals himself to man and not a distinct person, how does the Spirit of God move upon the face of the waters? Well, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters because the Spirit of God, the third person of the Godhead, moved upon the face of the waters. You see, the Trinity is depicted there, a person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. In Psalm 2, we read, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee. And that doesn't have reference to Jesus' incarnation, but that passage in Psalm 2 has reference to his resurrection. But nonetheless, you have the Father saying to the Son, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee. The Father speaking to the Son. Again, where is that written? Well, it's written in the book of Psalms, the second Psalm. How about later on in that Psalm where it says, Kiss the Son, lest he be angry. What Son are we talking about? We're talking about Jesus the Son of God, kiss the Son. You, you see, Psalm 2 is a prophecy of the crucifixion and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. If you want to get a prophetic reference to the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus and all the things that took place around the crucifixion, you simply read Psalm 2. And it speaks about the heathen being given to Jesus as an inheritance and kiss him lest he be angry. What is that speaking of? Well, it's speaking of the Son of God, the second person of the Godhead in Psalm 2. In Daniel chapter 3, as the three Hebrews were cast into the fiery furnace, the king looks in and he beholds four walking, and the fourth is the likeness of the Son of God. Who is that? That's the second person of the Godhead, the second person of the Godhead, right there with them in the fiery furnace. So even though clear cut and dry statements like 1 John 5, 7 or Matthew 28 and the Great Commission to baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And then in Acts, you have people being baptized in the name of the Lord. That's summarizing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Even though you don't have the concise cut and dry language that spells it out in easy to understand terms or as easy as there are to understand terms as you're explaining divinity, the Trinity, the triunity, the three-in-one Godhead is depicted in the Old Testament, undeniably. It's, un, it's an undeniable fact. In the New Testament, the three-in-one Godhead is depicted very, very clearly. Uh, in the book of Matthew chapter 3, in Matthew's gospel, as Jesus is baptized, when he was baptized and went up straightway out of the water, lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. What just happened there? The Son of God manifest in human flesh. Now, here's another point concerning divinity. The second person of the Godhead is the Word of God, the Son of God, which was made flesh and became the Son of Man as he was conceived of the Holy Ghost in the womb of a virgin named Mary. Any doctrine that attacks the divinity and the eternality of Jesus Christ as the second person of the Godhead is heresy. So let me be very, very clear on that. But as Jesus is baptized, notice what happens. The Spirit of God descended on Jesus like a dove. Who is that? It's the third person of the Godhead descending on the second person of the Godhead incarnate in human flesh. The word that was with God, was God, and was with God, who made all things in the beginning, John 1, that was made flesh and dwelt among us, this Word made flesh, the second person of the Godhead made flesh, <clears throat> as he was baptized, the Spirit descended upon him like a dove. And then what happened after Jesus was baptized? A voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Who spoke those words? God the Father. So you have the words of God the Father ringing down in thundering, booming, sound from the heavens as the Son of God is baptized. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And the Spirit of God descends on him like a dove. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That's the Trinity, the triunity. Just a few more of these examples from the New Testament as we draw near to a close of today's video. John chapter 1 and verse 1. This begins the same way that Genesis begins, in the beginning. As Genesis begins, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. John 1 begins, in the beginning was the Word, 
and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And obviously the Word there has reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. In Revelation 19, written on his vesture is the Word of God. He is the Word. That is his name, the divine essence, the creative power of God, the divine expression, if you will. So, Jesus, the eternal Word, the eternal Son of God, and should we say that he's the eternal Son of God, that he become the Son of God as he was incarnate? No, understand that God sent his Son, made of a woman, made under the law. God is eternally Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's a wrench in the gears when you ask someone who denies the eternal Sonship, what was God the Father if God the Son is not eternally God the Son? God the what? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. If it's Father, Word, Holy Spirit, and the Word became the Son, then how was he God the Father for all of eternity. No, God sent his son, made of a woman, made under the law. But one of the titles of his son is the Word of God. And Jesus has many other names in the Word of God. But one of these titles, and particularly with reference to creation, is the Word, the divine expression. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Now, our concept is a trinity. I don't know if you've ever noticed this. In the beginning was the Word, that is Christ. He was with God. He was God. The same was in the beginning with God. So look at that again. He was with God. He was God. He was in the beginning with God. Is John being repetitious or redundant there? No. There is a theological truth concerning the Trinity in John 1, 1. He was with God. He was God. He was with God. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. You see, the Father is God. The Holy Ghost is God. The Son is God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. He's the Creator. He is the Creator. Another example is from Revelation 4, 8. The celestial beings and all this heavenly host in glory sing to God, Holy, Holy, Holy. Why Holy, Holy, Holy? Why not just Holy? Because God is thrice Holy, not twice Holy, not four times holy, but thrice holy because God exists in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You might refer to him as the thrice holy God. So we'll summarize just a few of these attributes of God and bring our video for today to a close. God is, as we just said, holy. He's hallowed. He's sanctified. He's separate from sinners. He's lofty. He's above. He's better. He's pure. He's undefiled. God is holy. God is also all-powerful. Revelation 19, 6, the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. That word omnipotent means all-power. Omnipotent. Omnipotent. Number three, God is all-knowing. Isaiah 46, 10, he declares the end from the beginning. I'll turn there and read it for you so I don't paraphrase it and get it wrong. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, I will do all my pleasure. God declares the end from the beginning because he knows everything. Known of God are all his works from the beginning of creation. So God has all knowledge. He's all present. What did Paul say in Acts 17? In him we live and move and have our being. But he also went on to say, though he be not very far from any of us, God is everywhere present and nowhere absent. Daniel 4.35 teaches that God is sovereign. And this is something that we'll come back to uh, a concept we'll come back to in subsequent videos. God is sovereign. That means God does what God wants when God wants to. God has the prerogative. He owns this universe. He can, and He does, choose to save people. He chose His people before the foundation of the world. He chooses when to intervene and disrupt in providence and thwart the wicked God is sovereign in creation, He's sovereign in salvation, He's sovereign in His judgment of this world, and He'll be sovereign in the destruction of this world. He worketh His will among the army of heaven, uh, of heaven, among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay His hand or say unto Him, What doest thou? Daniel 4.35. So God does what God wants to do at all times. God is immutable. This means that God doesn't change. God is immutable. God is the same he said in Malachi 3, 6, I am the Lord, I change not, therefore you sons of Jacob are not consumed. Hebrews chapter 13 says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He does not change. 
but he is very much immutable. And finally, number seven, God concerning deity and divinity is alone. God alone is God. God is the only true and living God. We'll turn to Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 10 and read that as our final passage today. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. There were no gods before God. There will be no gods after God. I will not become a God. You will not become a God. No one will become a God. There were no gods before him. He is eternal. From everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. And God alone is the only true deity, the only true God that has ever been and that will ever be. To put it the way that our Articles of Faith put it, and we'll close with this, we believe in only one true and living God, the Father, the Word, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Thanks for watching. I'd love your feedback. Be sure to leave us a comment, write us, let us know that you tuned in to our very first inaugural pilot episode, our first MTZ video cast. Again, I'm Ben Winslet thanking you for tuning in. Look forward to hearing from you and seeing you soon. God bless.